we, we had uh, been interested in, in how plants uh, transition to reproductive growth or flowering, often in coordination with particular environmental parameters, in this case, the length of day, how many hours there are in a day. And we had discovered, again, through basic biology and quantitative genetics, a particular gene that in wild tomatoes was functional and intact and restricted tomatoes to flower their best under shorter day conditions. So we were able to go in with CRISPR and create completely uh, uh, knocked out versions or dead versions of the gene, which allowed us to develop varieties that were even earlier flowering and earlier yielding and therefore have the potential to be grown in northern latitudes where day lengths are extraordinarily long during the summer and the summer itself is very short. So you're working with two parameters now that you can fit into with these types of modifications. We haven't deployed such plants yet, but the principle is there in that paper to show that this is possible. Most people would think that CRISPR has nothing to do with a problem like climate change. You know, how, what is CRISPR going to do for the atmosphere? What, what's your favorite example of CRISPR being used to tackle a problem that, you know, may seem totally unrelated? Well, um, thinking of a project that was going on at UC Berkeley um, with a team that was trying to develop a, um, uh, an industrial strain of yeast for production of small molecules that, um, you know, that, are, that, are, that are useful either as biofuels or for other kinds of chemical purposes, we call them green chemicals because they're being made not in a chemical factory but by, uh, by natural uh, organisms. And um, I learned that, uh, you know, I, I think of yeast as being you know, one of the classical model organisms, which it is, but it turns out there's a lot of other strains of yeast that are more useful industrially. I guess they can grow at higher temperatures and more densely and things like that, um, but they're much less genetically uh, tractable. And so this group had actually used the CRISPR technology to introduce into one of these industrial strains of yeast enzymes from a different organism that allowed the yeast to literally eat cellulose, which is like the, you know, bark, you know, material that comes from tree bark and things like that, uh, could now eat cellulose and turn it into, you know, metabolites such as uh, molecules that would be useful for biofuel production and other kinds of chemical syntheses. So that was something that I thought was very kind of cute, you know, and, and it was a fun experiment because the student doing it could literally take this, take the, the natural uh, yeast that they started with and put it on a piece of paper and nothing happens. But after this engineering was done, they put the yeast on a piece of paper and the paper gets gone. It's gone. Right? It's chewed up. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> it's very cool. That's yeah. <laughs>